Uh, Mayor Dirk Durkin, good morning. Thank you for taking some time. Good morning, Brandy. So let's talk about that first. What is different today in the city as it pertains to public safety than it was on Sunday? So I think what is different is we are focused on a number of things together with community. We were doing them before. I want to make it very clear. But we've seen this uptick in violence, one of the most sobering weekends in the city of Seattle, which is consistent with what we've seen nationwide. I mean, Brandy, I was really stunned when I looked at the data over 900 shooting incidents in a week across our country, from Minneapolis to D.C., um, and Seattle has not been immune. So we are focused on two things. Number one is to make sure that we have the adequate police response we need when police are needed, and two is to continue our work with community-based strategies to interrupt this violence. Uh, so let's talk about a, a little bit about those strategies. You outlined some investments um, that you hope to make, uh, uh, not only to community groups that are dealing with this and trying to prevent violence, um, but also some city investments. Um, how long might it take to see those manifest and to see them make a difference? It will take some time because you standing up these programs, it doesn't change overnight. We've seen, however, for example, our Health One program has been very successful, and now we're, we're scaling that up significantly. We are going to increase the number of community service officers, which are the civilian arm of SPD that get embedded in community, that are really valued by community. I was in Chinatown International District last weekend, and the CSOs that have been working there for about a year are really valued by all the businesses and residents there. We're also looking to a new triage program so that when someone calls 911 on certain types of calls, we seen we send police, but they may not be needed. They've determined themselves by looking at the data. So we want a different response to those calls. So we free up the police to be able to respond to those situations when you really need a police officer to respond. Yeah, you made that clear yesterday that if this weekend showed us anything, it's that you need armed police officers for some responses. You pointed out we have lost 250 police officers in the last 17 months. We're on track to lose 300. How do you recover from that? We, we have to be able to hire more good police officers. You know, we were hamstrung a little bit because there were fewer training classes because of COVID. So they've added extra classes. The chief is looking to hire as many as possible and also importantly, retain the good police officers we have. We're losing too many officers. And it's not surprising, Brandy, if you've got elected officials saying they're gonna cut 50% of people, officers and their families need security. Um, they need to know that they're they're supported. And so we really need to show the op the good officers we have, do what we need to retain them and make sure that their working conditions are good. Right, but how do, how do you do that? How do you convince them? 250 officers in 17 months? Uh, it'll be 300 before long. Uh, you have a city council where the political climate has not changed. We're in the midst of a mayoral race where one of the leading candidates uh, was a key backer of defunding. So why would, if I'm a, a police officer who's coming from another agency or who's, uh, you know, wants to just join the profession, why would I come to Seattle? You know, I've talked to a lot of officers who are here because they like to serve and they wanted to be in a city some and really serve the people. They enjoy their job, and, and I think that the chief has done a good job of looking after the wellness of officers to make sure that we give them the shifts they need and try to do breaks, but at the same time that they know they are supported in their work. And so you know, we need to show these officers that it's a good place to serve and, and that we will respect their work and support their work. And at the same time, the officers themselves want those, those alternatives built out too. I mean, I've said it before, Brandy, if you put police officers at one table and community another, there'll be so much overlap on the jobs they think that cops need to respond versus other alternatives. And we've put more and more on the plate of police officers that really shouldn't be there. So let's take that, give it to other base uh, community based solutions and other strategies and let you know, have officers do the job where we really need a police officer to show up. Yeah, but as you said, and you're right, officers don't want to respond to 10,000 calls of people in crisis a year. That has been, uh, the, the failing mental health system has been thrust onto them, and that's not fair. But, you know, you said it yesterday, you need to put those alternatives in place before you pull the rug out from underneath the police department and the public safety net for the city. You know, there's all this savings, and I, I'm using air quotes, Mayor, I know you can't see me right now. There's all this savings with officers leaving, uh, millions of dollars that, you you know, isn't being given to officers' salaries who have left the department, and there continues to be demands from the council that they take that, quote, savings, and they put it elsewhere, and they take it out of the Seattle Police Department. How do you stop that from happening? 
we will be sending to council a comprehensive plan on what we do with the money that Seattle Police Department um, isn't utilizing because we've lost so many officers. And I think that the community, the city of Seattle expects its leaders to provide for community safety. And it is a false choice to say we have to choose between community-based solutions and police officers. We need both. And I think that what we have to be focused on then is how do we make sure that when we have something like Saturday night where you have multiple incidents happen, that you're not using every police officer on duty, having to bring in an extra shift early and keep a shift on just to respond. We, you know, community safety is a fundamental duty of government and we need to have adequate officers to do it right. And for those officers to be able to do their job well, we need to make sure that there, there is enough officers to provide backup and relief. You say that, but you're not gonna be around for very long. Uh, and there are not a lot of other elected leaders in the city who are echoing your sentiments. There are a couple, but there are not very many. Uh, you told me that you're not going to make any endorsements ahead of the primary next week. But is there any message that you would give to the citizens of Seattle as they go to fill those ballots out? I, look, I think voting matters. And I think people need to make a choice based on what is the city that they want and that they feel that they want, not just for today, but for the future. Um, and community safety is a really important part of that, but so are a range of other things. So I would say look at someone's record um, and what they've done, and then ba based on that, what you think they'll do in the future. All right, a couple things uh, on, on you know, gun crimes I want to talk to you about. You'll remember the shooting at 3rd and Pine. People remember that happened right before the pandemic, and so it sort of fell out of the news, but it was a violent shooting at 3rd and Pine. After that, we went to great lengths pulling um, case files from the King County Prosecutor's Office on uh, crimes that involved the use of a gun. And what we found is time and time again, Plea deals were given to criminals who used a gun in their, cr in their crime, probably out of convenience uh, to expedite the process. But if the city of Seattle cares so much about gun crimes, why are we giving plea deals to people who use guns to commit crimes? So, Brandy, as you know, that the city doesn't make those deals. The, the King County. The but you're a former prosecutor. So from your perspective, as a former prosecutor, <clears throat> should we be giving those deals to people who use guns? Look, I think we have to use every strategy we have to get guns off the street. And when people use guns in a crime, we have to have special interventions. So I think, you know, we can look at these 900 shootings across the country and say we want it reduced. And there's a various things that have led to it that lead to this uptick in violence. But one common thread is everybody's carrying a gun when they shoot someone. And so we need fewer guns on the street and we need to have strategies that when guns are used, that we have uh, the right accountability. Uh, Chief Diaz says that he's working with federal authorities right now to be looking at other ways that the city can make sure that people that bring guns and use guns in crime may be held accountable in the federal system. Um, I think we have to be looking at all those tools. All right, I want to end with this. I'm going to have you, um, I want to ask you about something you said yesterday. People might take issue with the question I'm going to ask you after I play it, but that's okay because we don't have room to have anything other than blunt conversation. So uh, listen to yourself from yesterday, Mayor. We saw last year so many voices in the street demanding community alternatives to policing, to bring attention to the systemic racism that has impacted communities of color, particularly the black community, for generations. Make no mistake about it, this gun violence is also disproportionately impacting those communities of color. Mayor Durkin, when people on the right say what you said there at the end, they're called racist. Maybe not with the nuance that you say it, but when they raise concern about the violence that's happening in these communities of color, they're called racist. And I think that we have this, and you use the nuance that's appropriate. I think we have this inability to, on one side, talk about police reform, and on the other side, talk about some of the violence issues in communities of color and what's happening there. Um, why, why do we have such an inability to use nuance in this conversation about how we can save people's lives. So Brandy, we, you know, I, one of the things in the last few weeks that, uh, that I did that was really hard was I sat down with some of the families that have been impacted by violence and also some of the community leaders in a place where violence had recently happened. And what we had to focus on are how do we help the families in the community? Um, and we have seen time and time again that this 
is impacting our communities of color more than it is impacting other communities. You know, for example, if you look at, you know, African Americans make up about 7% of the population of the city of Seattle, but almost 60% of the gun deaths have been of African American men. We can't stand for that. We have to have strategies and work and stand with the community to address that. Um, and so until we're willing to have some of those conversations and to say that's not all right, those Black Lives Matter, but with the community. Um, and I think that that's what is important is the community is looking to the city of Seattle to say, what are the solutions you have so that mothers are not burying their sons, people are not losing their fathers and their brothers. Um, and I think that's what our obligation is, as elected leaders. Yeah, and you can have those critical conversations without dismissing police reform. Both of those conversations can happen at the same time. Mayor Jenny Durkin, I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, and we will watch to see uh, not only on the, the violence front, hopefully um, this doesn't continue, but also in the effort to retain and hire police officers. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.